Gotta do something fancy here. What's up YouTube? Welcome to this very first video here on the Poker Ambition channel. Now, for those of you who don't know me or are not familiar with the Poker Ambition brand, let me give you guys a very quick introduction. I'm Rene, better known as The Weko Online. I've been playing professional poker for over 10 years now. Started off playing free rolls, working my way all the way up to the highest stakes in online cash games. Now, after completing the road to high stakes ourselves, we decided to start Poker Ambition, where we've been helping a group of cash game players do exactly the same. Our next goal is to help to teach the rest of the world how to get poker success as well. Not only in cash games, but also in empty teeth, sitting goes, you name it. Because in the end, poker is poker. It's the same game. Now to start off this direction in the right way, I decided to record a session of you guys where I've been playing some 500 and nil zoom. Now, instead of just going in and playing and showing you a lot of nice plays, I decided to give this video a little bit of a theme and that is where does my EV have to come from? I think modern name poker is a bit too stuck in the mindset of okay what do I have to do here? What does the solver do? How do I play GTO? And we kind of get, we kind of lose the, the main objective while playing a hand which is basically making as much money EV as possible. The better players they ask themselves these questions and come up with better answers. Therefore, choose the right decision while playing a hand. You can generate EV in many different ways. For example, if you play against a nit uh, who's overfolding, you're bluffing him more. If you play against a station, you will bluff him less. You know, it's things that you're already doing. Now, obviously, this is quite superficial and you can go deep, 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 deeper down the layers and it will get a bit more complicated. But what I will do is I will play a session and I will try to come back to this question as much as possible, showing you my thought process and why I take a certain line and why I think that line has the most EV. So without further ado, let's get into the action. So I'm not going to try to state the obvious too much. Um, and we'll try to only comment on what I think is relevant. Um, Queen and suited versus a half pot seabed. Don't really want to raise. Getting re raised would be disastrous. Um, want to just go ahead and call and realize our equity. Turn is interesting. If he checks, uh, we would probably have a mixed strategy. There are some hands that would want to bet small uh, to get some protection of like, hand like King 10. But at the same time, we also have another advantage with um, some two pairs, some sets, some six, uh, some straights, if you check. So probably those ingredients would lead to a mixed strategy. But uh, queen nine, I think is a pure fault. Queen three suited. I'll be playing a mixed strategy from the small blind. Don't think either one strategy or the other is better. Uh, it depends on your execution. Do you execute a limp strategy in a bad way? It's worse than a race only and vice versa. And you will hear me see, say, say this quite a lot. Uh, I see, I've watched a lot of videos and a lot of players say it's close. Everything is close and they just do whatever. Um, there's some truth to that because multiple strategies can have high EV. I mean, if you look at a solver, EVs don't really vary that much when you look at strategies. The execution of the strategy is always going to be the, ter the determining factor uh, in how much EV you're expected to make with a strategy. So race only mixed uh, doesn't really matter. I guess what you could say is don't play 80% VPIP in race only and don't play 30% VPIP in a mixed strategy from the small blind. Those are like two extremes that I think are obviously bad. But from there, you can uh, kind of go either way. Um, this end here, the fish checks back. Um, I'm just gonna take a step at the pot. I think it's a spot where we're gonna have to step twice quite a lot um, due to villain. Probably having a bunch of continues on the turn. I was actually quite surprised he was folding. 
So I think that's actually also an uh, important spot here versus a 2.2. I'm going to go for a cold call. I see many players like to play three bet only from the small blind. In general, you will see this. I'm not really a static player, I guess. Um, I mean, he opened to 2.2, so I don't think having a flatting range is bad. Actually, I think it's, it's probably good. On the turn, I think we're gonna use a, a polarized strategy. So that's what I will do. I think we have an advantage in most hands after it gets checked around. Six for off is usually a fold. Um, this player is on the more aggressive side. So against him, I will definitely fold because my realization will be way less than, for example, versus a passive player or versus a fish. For example, you would call six for offsuit versus a fish uh, due to your playability being better. And it's not only against a fish, I think also this is a, this is a mistake I see a lot of players make. Uh, is, I'm gonna open a7 here, I don't know this guy. If it turns out to be a wreck, uh, it would be quite a loose open. But what I'm trying to say is with the six for off, um, I think people lack to differentiate in between racks. They have racks or fish. Uh, I personally, I mean, you see multiple colors coming by. I like to tag a racks in maybe like four colors and fish as well in like four colors. And then I even have like an in-between color uh, because certain player types, certain hands play differently. Ace two's off against a 2.2, I'm going to call. Would have opened a bit bigger, I would have folded. But yeah, I think touching straight on to some topics that I think are interesting um, is the fact that I think modern day poker is played too static. Uh, we try to think in rules. Uh, we either do this all the time, we do this. And then you have the other players who are non-static, but they do everything based on RNG. Shout out to the RNG. I mean, I have RNG running here. I think the RNG is fine if you don't have reads. Uh, for example, I'm playing quite readless here. Um, so then I think an RNG can definitely come in handy, but you either have the camp that randomize too often, and then you have the camp that are too static. And you might've guessed it. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. And I think this is due to the way people approach poker. Uh, they try to simplify it for themselves, try to create rules, but uh, it lacks deeper learning of the game, I would say. Um, versus the fish here, I'm gonna build a big pot. I think that seems like a smart thing to do. See if it's half pot. Um, yeah, we have quite a strong hand. Don't have any reads um, on this villain. Let's say he would be super aggressive, then maybe I would do something else. Uh, but I think a hand as strong as ace nine um, to jump into the team of the video, where does my EV have to come from? When we have two pair there, even if villain is quite aggressive, our EV doesn't necessarily have to come from his aggression because we can value better ourselves and get called by worse hands quite easily. Let's say, for example, we have a hand that's weaker than ace nine, so two pair, let's say we have ace five. Ace five would be a hand, oh, actually ace five, we would also never check raise. Let's say ace jack, we could check raise or check call. That hand would clearly become a check call when he becomes more aggressive. Three is here, it's quite a loose open. Um, but I think on that table, it's fine. Same for four, do suited. There's a, I think it's a fish in the big blind. So then I think it's a fine open. And I'm gonna go for like a, a min bet on this mono board. In general, monotone boards, you want to use small sizings. Um, don't think having a 10 here is great because we're blocking hands that he would fold to a barrel. I think a bad check bet seems like the smartest option. He bets himself, so then I think we have an easy fold. No reason to raise there with the 10-4. Like I said, the reason that the 10 was 
bad in the barrel is the same reason why a 10 would be bad in the river race line because we are blocking hands that he would most likely bluff with. But yeah, so the staticness of players or the too much RNGing or too much randomizing of players is because of a lack of our understanding of where EV comes from and a lack of a deeper understanding, I think, how the game works. Um, and we have done a couple of questionnaires and one of the biggest pain points of the modern day poker population is that they yeah they don't they lack understanding of why certain things work in a certain way uh, this hand here is quite interesting could do two things i think this one would go for a big bet some of the time i'm gonna go for a check I think it's either a big bet or a check. That I think is what makes most sense. Here we have like the nuts with backup equity. So I think it's a good spot to go for an over bet. And I think here we're just gonna check fold. I think it was like ace queen. Where does EV come from with ace queen? Ace queen is kind of a, a sucky hand. Like we can bet big as a bluff. But basically we never get a better hand to fold and never really get a i mean we get a worse hand to call i guess like a flush draw um, it's also too thin to value bet or too weak to value bet for a small sizing so i think after he calls a three bet he's already quite strong in these positions so i think check folding or betting big would have been the the two options We play Limpot PL1337. Don't know who he is, but he leads out. Interesting play. Interesting play. I think we can peel once. We raise here. This is quite a neutralist board. I think with the three. Five. Three five is a hand that kind of sucks, especially he completes, so the five is not really a great hand to have. Uh, we block some bluffs and our improves aren't that clean, uh, given it's a limp pot, so we can have a hand like lose five offsuit, for example. Three is, I think, check call is, uh, is the way to go. I think going check raise bad bad. Uh, I mean, we're quite deep. We don't have the nuts, um, so I think our EV shouldn't come from going check raise bet bet. I think then what is left is maybe a yeah, basically better hands. He doesn't over bet, which I think is interesting. Maybe actually I'll go for a raise here. The reason I did raise a turn is basically he could have overbet the turn. I mean, he, he had multiple options there. It was again a spot where he has another advantage. So usually when you have another advantage, there is a big sizing involved. Doesn't mean he only has to bet big because there's quite a lot of hands that would benefit from uh, from from betting smaller, like the three quarters pot. Let's say, for example, he has had like sixes or sevens, five, six, five, seven, uh, maybe eight, seven. Those are all hands that want to bet, but not necessarily for an over bet. So then what happens is, um, yeah, you, 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 you get a mixed strategy. When he doesn't, uh, the reason I didn't want to check raise a flop is because we still had a lot of streets to play. We still have quite a lot of streets to play. And basically on the turn, a safe card arrived. Um, so we have more equity versus his range. Given the fact that he better at the three quarter sizing, I thought the check raise would be, uh, would be a good play. I 
I think this is something that uh, it's like deeper step dynamics. It's something that uh, obviously MTT players will have uh, less experience with. And what I often see is that they try to get too much money in um, when they're deeper. Basically, no, I have to watch out what I say <laughs> that, that I don't get the whole FTT community on my back. Uh, but basically it's more like, okay, I have a strong hand, let's build a pot. And they don't necessarily build a pot from the perspective of, okay, where does my EV have to come from? I think this hand is a good hand to bet. I think a hand like King Jack. Hmm. So I think a lot of hands would probably bet. Gotta do something fancy here. Basically, yeah, that was the only downside of my play. Uh, but basically what I was trying to do is uh, Trying to look quite polarized there with the ace 10. If he had a hand like, if he did have a hand like Jack Queen or King Jack, which I thought was unlikely, so I thought a 10 would probably be the best hand. Um, he has quite a poor bluff catcher, whereas if he has eights or nines against the two and a half times pot, he has quite a good bluff catcher. So it was uh, a merge on the river, as we call it. And basically, you merge when you can get a better hand to fold and a worse hand to call. And the bigger I size, the more polarized I become, um, the better, yeah, the better eights and nines become as bluff catchers where I had like 10-9, 10-8, uh, and the more I had like King Jack becomes a fold. Unfortunately, he has ace jack some of the time, yeah, and then we don't really have a great hand. Here we went for the check raise with jack eight, which is on the loser side. But I would check, I would check uh, three bet jack eight suited a big proportion of the time. And I think jack eight here is quite a good combo as it, um, it will connect on basically any turn. A queen, a jack, a nine, seven, a five. It has a lot of connectivity. So basically when you pick a hand to check raise, look at uh, future possibilities. And I thought the jack eight would be a great hand for a check raise based on those factors. Check five, I think it's a, wow. it's a kind of a whatever. And I think this is also an important point, like the kind of the whatever, like I said, it's something that you hear quite often. Oh, it's, 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 it's like whatever. Um, The whatevers don't mean that you should just use your random non the, 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 the whatevers mean that EVs are close. And when EVs are close, you have to ask yourself the question, where does my EV come from? So for example, um, with the Jack-5 suited, if I would have a read on my opponent that he's a bit better, uh, then I would always fold. If I have a read on my opponent that he's a bit worse, maybe a bit more passive, I would always call. Ace queen suited with three bet, we have face a four bet. I think it's quite standard. Um, if he C bets, it's interesting. I don't think if I jam, he will fold ace king. So I don't really think by jamming, I can get better hands to fold. Would have also been interesting if he checks. I think it's a great spot to check raise with ace king. They didn't do it, so I think calling is kind of the option that's left. We never have to fold the turn. I think that's good. He checks turn. I think it's quite a similar story. I don't think Ace King will fold. Um, so then basically all we do with betting is uh, getting called by worse and letting better, better hand folds. The benefit of betting though is that we will never get bluffed on the river because obviously we need to improve in order for us to call. He checks again.
I don't, yeah, not really sure if Ace King would fold. Um, I think this is all we could do with our hand. Realize. An attorney is not falling, flop is not falling. River is debatable. If he folds, he 9 10 suited or something does get there. Ah, so well do. Don't really know who this guy is, but. Literally go all the way. Anyway, we can 3 bet, we can fold, we can call. Which means the table dynamics, for example, become quite important. And check my suit. I think I will always three bet. Earlier I three bet a jack nine suited, which he also opened smaller. I think could also be a great and easy hand to call. I went for the three bet that time. And you will see me use uh, RNGs for pre flop at a higher frequency because, like I said, I'm playing sort of readless. And as I also stated, it, it is true um, that EVs are close either way. So that it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna go for the limp brace with ace king. I'm gonna go to quite a small sizing. I think uh, if you look at his range, I think that's the range he gets most. Um, that's the sizing that his range gets most trouble with. I think this is a good spot to fire out some big bets. And the limp pot I'm gonna probably go for high frequency bet on this board. Queen 9 deuce, quite a good board for me. It goes for a small race, which puts my hand puts my hand in kind of a ugly spot. But if I had a backdoor, I would call. Maybe I should be calling this. Maybe I can do some leading on like a 10, a jack, a king, etc., etc. Uh, but usually, if people make a small race on a board that I already had an advantage, yeah, I, I, I'm not really too concerned. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if 7, 8 would call sometimes if you would implement uh, um, some aggression on turn cards that are favorable for me like a, I was I was considering uh, the 10 and the jack because the 10 and the jack would complete broadways and in a limp pot he is most likely to raise broadways preflop so that gives me a range advantage and from a range advantage you can usually apply pressure because you have hands that our opponent doesn't have This end can be a three bet or a call. I'm gonna call this time because I have a fissure in the big blind, uh, which basically increases my increases the, uh, the EV of my call. For a race here with ace5, I think if we have ace5 with backdoors or something, we have a fine hand to call with. Without the backdoors, I think it's a bit too weak. Um, so then it becomes either a fold or a race. I think fold is usually the play, but you know. I don't, I don't mind the race. And on the turn, we pick up some equity. Uh, I decided to go for the small bet. Usually when you pick up equity in these kind of situations, you have to be quite careful because the SPR becomes quite small, um, meaning we will get check raise quite a lot, uh, which kind of sucks for a hand like ace five. I 
jumping then jack here is a hand that can definitely bet we do need i mean protection is a little bit of a big of a word but you know he has some queen eyes and king eyes that are gonna fold which is great river is quite interesting i think we should maybe go for a small bet He didn't bite. So where should EV come from in this situation? I decided to go for the small bet. I think a jack will always raise, so we don't lose value from that. Uh, he could still bluff raise. The thing with the limp pot scenario here is that he's gonna have hands like deuce five off maybe. Um, and against that hand, we probably want to check. But he also has some king highs and queen highs that could call versus a one bet that would check behind. So this is kind of the debate you have to weigh in consideration in your in your mind. Um, a good general rule is when you doubt between betting and checking, betting small is, I found usually quite a good solution because it kind of fetches the best of both worlds. Get a barrel here. I'm gonna call again with the ace 10. We still have some showdown value with ace high. Um, we dominate his draws. River is quite interesting. It's quite a good card for us. It's a very good card for us actually. I'm gonna go for a small block bet here on the river. I think that 10, maybe, like I think the board does give us some advantage, but you know, we're quite vulnerable also for raises. Um, so then the solution could either be to check and not dunk bet, that's obviously one, or the solution would be to just size down a little bit more. I already went from one third to 20, but maybe we could have even went smaller. This hand could raise call, limp call. I think limp raising is an option. Interesting turn. Gonna bet again. Gonna size down a little bit because the board's getting quite scary. And remember, we talked about looking at these advantages and in, in a limp pot, like the 5 3 off, the 5 8 off, our hands that, or the 4 6 off, our hands that he will have, and I don't. And in general, if you start to build a big pot and put a lot of money in the pot when your opponent has way more nut combos than you, even if he doesn't uh, try to exploit that, then it's probably still not a great idea. Hi, hello board is quite good for the in position three better. So we're gonna go for a small sizing. He will have quite a lot of pocket pairs that are going to have trouble defending so i think on the flop we have quite a print spot and with our exact holding we will probably continue with firing here with kings the board is mono uh, which always means that you know if a diamond hits shit hits the fan I'll go for a check i think with kings that is fine our hand doesn't really need much protection um, we want him to hit a pair with like a like jack queen of spades or a jack of spades and a queen of hearts or something. And he might decide to bluff at some point. He didn't really bet. I think, I think he's going to just fold a lot. Um, 
but I'll still squeeze in a small bet. We got me with 6.5. It's a, it's a board where it's just quite hard to get a lot of value uh, from worse hands, especially when you're deeper. Uh, I think it's important to delay your aggression for later streets. The pool has gotten quite tough. Not playing the Jack Nine suited there. Okay, we get a dunk bet here from the fish. He dunks out nine nine Jack. I think I should proceed by calling. Jacks is quite interesting. I'm gonna bet once. Uh, thought there was a chance that. Uh, thought there was a chance he could be dogmatic like a low pocket pair or some random hand like ace high. So I think on the turn we can make him fold those kind of hands. If he does check call the turn, I think I'm done with the hand. I think he's most likely going to have a jack or he's trapping me. Um, and I think a jack is not really going to fold unless the river brings something scary. But if something scary comes in, I also make a hand. Maybe on the ace I would have bluffed. But that, I guess, is uh, basically the only card. Defend the 9-10. Go for a jack call. On the turn, I think I'm gonna go for a lead. It's not necessarily that we have an advantage on the queen. Here, I think uh, this one's quite close. SPR is not that big. I'm gonna make a tight fold here. So I'm, I'm leading turn here, not necessarily because the queen is a better card for me. I don't think that's actually the case. Um, because I'm gonna check raise, let's say I had ace queen or king queen. I would check raise at a high percentage of the time he's still, and he will always have them as well. But after I check call, basically if he's gonna see that a lot, I'm gonna fold a lot of my air. And when I call, I kind of have a made hand region where he still has a lot of air. So on the turn, I think, for example, he can have a hand like jack seven that I would just check fold on with on the flop. So my range is more um, made hand heavy and he has more air. And usually when there's a spot where villain has a lot of air, um, you want to be doing a lot of small betting. Um, and in this case, that's dunking. But for example, the reason why we see that a lot in position is also um, basically based on the fact that, yeah, villain has quite a lot of air. We have an advantage, so that's why we see that a lot for one third sizing. It's a think I'm calling versus a mid race. And I'll be leading this flop. I think this flop is quite favorable for me from the small blind. If you look at what I'm gonna call. Jack six off, I probably have to call against a 2.4. I think we're gonna approach this board a bit more on the polarized side, so I'm not going to be betting jack six. Here I open threes, which is a bit loose, but there's a weaker player on the button. Go check, he goes for a half pot delay on a card that's definitely way more favorable for me. Since he's opening 2.4, I will have way more 4x offsuit in my range. We think jack six is uh, an easy call. If he checks, I find it very unlikely that we're beat. So I'm gonna make a very big bet here. 
don't think he has a king. I think Jack X is his most likely holding. Uh, and I think we can actually fold him off a chop here. So basically, if he if if the most likely hand that he has when he bats turn and then checks river is a jack without a kicker. So not ace jack. I think ace jack is probably strong enough to value that himself again. Because you don't really want to check and me checking back jack x. I didn't check back jack x. I bet a two and a half times pot. But uh, in general, I don't think people will expect me to do that. So then I think we sort of have a free will situation. Whereas if he has a jack often enough. Um, yeah. And basically he can fold the chop. So I like that play. Uh, the recreation opens to three X. He has 30 big blinds. This guy is definitely on the loser crazy side. Um, there's no one behind me, which means I don't really have to think in a balanced way versus a recreational. So I'm gonna go for an exploitative three bet sizing of 15. This way, we will have a bit less than pot left. And we can basically get it in on any type of flop. Now the question is, how do we want to get it in? And I think in this case, our hand is not strong enough to value bet, so our value should come from letting him bluff something. So let's hope he didn't hit. He didn't, he had a worse hand. Very important to When you've already decided that you're getting the money in, then your objective is to try to find a way that getting the money in has highest EV. Here, it's quite close. I think checking is a bit better. When the king hits, I don't think we can value better ace high. Um, if this was a nine or lower or something, I would have definitely value bet in a limp pot. And I think on the river, we have quite a clear check call. I mean, he's repping a king. Uh, right, he could definitely have, I mean, it's a limp pot, so he can have basically anything. I think actually this is gonna be a good time to call it a part one. If you like this video, then give it a thumbs up. The meanwhile here we have pocket threes. And king five. I think it's important to not uh, play your low pairs too passive all the time. So I like my stab there. And with the king five, Checked it down, basically nothing happened. So I think we can probably squeeze out a small bet. But yeah, I think this is a good time to, uh, to wrap up the first part of the video. Make sure to check out the second part of the video, which will be released. Good question. Actually, that's information I currently don't, don't have, but a, a, a bit later after this video, I guess. Make sure to subscribe and turn notifications on when the part two does release. You are the first to know. If you have any questions about hands that we were played or about me or about poker ambition, please leave them in the comments down below. And we will get back to you guys. Looking forward to see you in part two, I'm sure. I'm gonna try my best that a lot of interesting spots will come up. So see you then.